Victorian Periodical Parade. Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to another reading of Lady Audley's Secret. I'm very happy that you could make it back over here to our program, Victorian Periodical Parade. Today I'm prepared to read Chapter 9. So let's get into it. Chapter 9. After the storm, Sir Michael was mistaken in his prophecy upon the weather. The storm did not hold off until the next day, but burst with terrible fury over the village of Audley about half an hour before midnight. Robert Audley took the thunder and lightning with the same composure with which he accepted all the other ills of life. He lay on a sofa in the sitting room, ostensibly reading the five days old Clemsford paper, and regaling himself occasionally with a few sips from a large tumbler of cold punch. But the storm had quite a different effect on George Talboys. His friend was startled when he looked at the young man's white face as he sat opposite the window, listening to the thunder, and staring at the black sky rent every now and then by forked streaks of steel-blue lightning. George, said Robert, after watching him for some time, are you frightened at the lightning? No, he answered curtly. But, my dear fellow, some of the most courageous men have been frightened at it. It is scarcely to be called a fear. It is constitutional. I am sure you are frightened at it. No, I am not. But, George, if you could see yourself white and haggard, with your great hollow eyes staring out at the sky as if they were fixed upon a ghost, I tell you I know that you are frightened, and I tell you that I am not. George Talboys, you are not only afraid of the lightning, but you are savage with yourself for being afraid, and with me for telling you of your fear. Robert Audley, if you say another word to me, I shall knock you down. Having said which, Mr. Talboys. Having said which, Mr. Talboys strode out of the room, banging the door after him with a violence that shook the house. Those inky clouds which had shut in the sultry earth as if with a roof of hot iron poured out their blackness in a sudden deluge as George left the room. But if the young man was afraid of the lightning, he certainly was not afraid of the rain. For he walked straight downstairs to the inn door and went out into the wet high road. He walked up and down, up and down in the soaking shower for about twenty minutes, and then, re-entering the inn, strode up to his bedroom. Robert Audley met him on the landing, with his hair beaten about his white face and his garments dripping wet. "'Are you going to bed, George?' Yes. But you have no candle. I don't want one. But look at your clothes, man. Do you see the wet streaming down your coat sleeves? What on earth made you go upon such a night? I am tired and I want to go to bed. Don't bother me. You'll take some hot brandy and water, George? Robert Audley stood in his friend's way as he spoke, anxious to prevent his going to bed in the state he was in. But George pushed him fiercely aside, and striding past him said, in the same hoarse voice Robert had noticed at the court, Let me alone, Robert Audley, and keep clear of me if you can. Robert followed George to his bedroom, but the young man banged the door in his face, so there was nothing for it but to leave Mr. Talboys to himself to recover his temper as best he might. He was irritated at my noticing his terror at the lightning, thought Robert, as he calmly retired to rest, serenely indifferent to the thunder which seemed to shake him in his bed, and the lightning playing fitfully round the razors in his open dressing case. The storm rolled away from the quiet village of Audley, and when Robert awoke the next morning it was to see bright sunshine and a peep of cloudless sky between the white curtains of his bedroom window. It was one of those serene and lovely mornings that sometimes succeed a storm. The birds sung loud and cheerily. The yellow corn uplifted itself in the broad fields and waved proudly after its sharp tussle with the storm, which had done its best to beat down the heavy ears with cruel wind and driving rain half the night through. The vine leaves clustering round Robert's window fluttered with a joyous rustling, 
shaking the raindrops in diamond showers from every spray and tendril. Robert Audley found his friend waiting for him at the breakfast table. George was very pale but perfectly tranquil, if anything indeed more cheerful than usual. He shook Robert by the hand with something of the old hearty manner for which he had been distinguished before the one affliction of his life overtook and shipwrecked him. Forgive me, Bob, he said frankly, for my surly temper of last night. You were quite correct in your assertion. The thunderstorm did upset me. It always had the same effect upon me in my youth. Poor old boy, shall we go up by the express, or shall we stop here and dine with my uncle tonight? Robert asked. To tell the truth, Bob, I would rather do neither. It's a glorious morning. Suppose we stroll about all day, take another turn with the rod and line, and go up to the town by the train that leaves around 6.15 in the evening? Robert Audley would have asserted to a far more disagreeable proposition than this, rather than have taken the trouble to oppose his friend. So the matter was immediately agreed upon, and, and after they had finished their breakfast and ordered a four o'clock dinner, George Talboys took the fishing rod across his broad shoulders and strolled out of the house with his friend and companion. But if the equable temperament of Mr. Robert Audley had been undisturbed by the crackling peals of thunder that shook the very foundations of the sun in, it had not been so with the more delicate sensibilities of his uncle's young wife. Lady Audley confessed herself terribly frightened of the lightning. She had her bedstead wheeled into a corner of the room, and with the heavy curtains drawn tightly round her, she lay with a face buried in the pillows, shuddering convulsively at every sound of the tempest without. Sir Michael, whose stout heart had never known a fear, almost trembled for his fragile creature whom it was his happy privilege to protect and defend. My lady would not consent to undress till nearly three o'clock in the morning, when the last lingering peal of thunder had died away amongst the distant hills. Until that hour she lay in her handsome silk dress, in which she had travelled, huddled together amongst the bedclothes, only looking up now and then with a scared face to ask if the storm was over. Towards four o'clock, her husband, who spent the night in watching by her bedside, saw her drop off into a deep sleep, from which she did not awake for nearly five hours. But she came into the breakfast room at half-past nine o'clock, singing a little Scotch melody. Her, che her cheeks tinged with a delicate pink as the pale hue of her muslin morning dress. Like the birds and the flowers, she seemed to recover her beauty and joyousness in the morning sunshine. She tripped lightly out to the lawn, gathering a last lingering rosebud here and there, and a sprig or two of geranium, and returning through the dewy grass, warbling long cadences for very happiness of heart, and looking as fresh and radiant as the flowers in her hand. The baronet caught her in his strong arms as she came through the open door. "'My poor one,' he said, "'my darling, what happiness to see your own merry self again. "'Do you know, Lucy, that once last night "'when you looked out through the dark green bed curtains "'with your poor white face "'and the purple rims around your hollow eyes, "'I had almost a difficulty to recognize my little wife "'in that ghastly, terrified, agonized-looking creature "'crying out about the storm. "'Thank God for the morning sun, "'which has brought back the rosy cheeks and the bright smile.' I hope to heaven, Lucy, I shall never again see you look as you did last night. She stood on tiptoe to kiss him, and was then only tall enough to reach his white beard. She told him, laughing, that she had always been a silly, frightened creature, frightened of dogs, frightened of cattle, frightened of a thunderstorm, frightened of a rough sea. Frightened of everything and everybody, but my dear, noble, handsome husband, she said, she had found the carpet in the dressing room disarranged, and had inquired into the mystery of the secret passage. She chid Miss Alicia in a playful, laughing way, for her boldness in introducing two great men into my lady's rooms. "'And they had the audacity to look at my picture, Alicia,' she said with mock indignation. "'I found the baize thrown on the ground, and a great man's glove on the carpet. Look!' 
She held up a thick driving glove as she spoke. It was George's, which he had dropped while looking at the picture. I shall go up to the sun and ask those boys to dinner, Sir Michael said as he left the court upon his morning walk round his farm. Lady Audley flitted from room to room in the bright September sunshine, now sitting down to the piano to trill out a ballad, or the first page of an Italian bravara, and running with rapid fingers through a brilliant waltz, now hovering about a stand of hothouse flowers, doing amateur gardening with a pair of fairy-like silver-mounted embroidery scissors, now strolling into her dressing room to talk to Phoebe Marks, I shall go up to the sun and ask those boys to dinner, Sir Michael said as he left the court upon his morning walk round his farm. Lady Audley flitted from room to room in the bright September sunshine, now sitting down to the piano to trill out a ballad, or the first page of an Italian bravara, and running with rapid fingers through a brilliant waltz now hovering about a stand of hothouse flowers, doing amateur gardening with a pair of fairy-like silver-mounted embroidery scissors, now strolling into her dressing room to talk to Phoebe Marks, and have her curls rearranged for the third or fourth time, for the ringlets were always getting into disorder, and gave no little trouble to Lady Audley's maid. My lady seemed on this particular September day restless from very joyousness of spirit and unable to stay long in one place or occupy herself with one thing. While Lady Audley amused herself in her own frivolous fashion, the two young men strolled slowly down the margin of a stream until they reached a shady corner where the water was deep and still and the long branches of the willows trailed into the brook. George Talboys took the fishing rod, while Robert stretched himself at full length on a railway rug, and balancing his hat upon his face as a screen from the sunshine, fell fast asleep. Those were happy fish in the stream on the banks of which Mr. Talboys was seated. They might have amused themselves to their heart's content with timid nibbles at the gentleman's bait without any manner endangering their safety for George only stared vacantly at the water, holding his rod in a loose, listless hand and with a strange faraway look in his eyes. As the church clock struck two, he threw down his rod and striding away along the bank, left Robert Audley to enjoy a nap, which according to that gentleman's habits was by no means unlikely to last for two or three hours. About a quarter of a mile farther on, George crossed a rustic bridge and struck into the meadows which led to Audley Court. The birds had sung so much all morning that they had, perhaps by this time, grown tired, and the lazy cattle were asleep in the meadows. Sir Michael was still away on his morning's ramble. Miss Alicia had scampered off an hour before upon her chestnut mare, and servants were all at dinner in the back part of the house and my lady had strolled, book in hand, into the shadowy lime walk, so the grey old building had never worn a more peaceful aspect than on the afternoon when George Talboys walked across the lawn to ring a sonorous peal at the sturdy iron-bound oak door. The servant who answered the summons told him Sir Michael was out and my lady walking in the lime tree avenue. He looked a little disappointed at this intelligence, and muttering something about wishing to see my lady or going to look for my lady, the servant did not clearly distinguish his words, strode away from the door without leaving either card or message for the family. It was full an hour and a half before this when Lady Audley returned to the house, not coming from the line walk, but from exactly the opposite direction, carrying her open book in her hand and singing as she came. Alicia had just dismounted from her mare and stood in the low-arched doorway with a great Newfoundland dog by her side. The dog, which had never liked my lady, showed his teeth with a surprised growl. Send that horrid animal away, Alicia, Lady Audley said impatiently. The brute knows that I am frightened of him and takes advantage of my terror, and yet they call the creatures generous and noble-natured. Bah, Caesar, I hate you and you hate me, and if you met me in the dark in some narrow passage you might fly at my throat and strangle me, wouldn't you? 
my lady safely sheltered behind her stepdaughter, shook her yellow curls at the angry animal, and defied him maliciously. Do you know, Lady Audley, that Mr. Talboys, the young widower, has been asking for Sir Michael and for you? Lady Audley lifted her penciled eyebrows. I thought he was coming to dinner, she said. Surely we shall have enough of him then. She had a heap of wild autumn flowers in the skirt of her muslin dress. She had come through the fields at the back of the court, gathering the hedgerow blossoms in her way. She ran lightly up the broad staircase to her own rooms. George's glove lay on a boudoir table. Lady Audley rang the bell violently, and it was answered by Phoebe Marks. Take that litter away, she said sharply. The girl collected the glove and a few withered flowers and torn papers lying on the table into her apron. What have you been doing all this morning? asked my lady. Not wasting your time, I hope. No, my lady, I have been altering the blue dress. It is rather dark on this side of the house, so I took it up to my own room and worked at the window. The girl was leaving the room as she spoke, but she turned round and looked at Lady Audley as if waiting for further orders. Lady Audley looked up at the same moment and the eyes of the two women met. Phoebe Marks, said my lady, throwing herself into an easy chair and trifling with the wild flowers in her lap. You are a good and industrious girl, and while I live and am prosperous, you shall never want a firm friend or a twenty-pound note. And so there, we shall leave it for today. I hope that this new scene and this new arrangement has been enjoyable for you guys today. I redid my uh, basement office space, and um, what did I do? I forgot something. I left something else behind. Oh, yes, I shaved. It's November, so why not make changes in this, that, and everything? Continue to follow us at Victorian Parade on Twitter, um, backslash Victorian Parade on Facebook, and Victorian Periodical Parade on YouTube. Yeah, if you enjoyed this reading, give us a like and hit the bell. Now you can subscribe and, and get notifications when we go live. Uh, next week, Dr. Kari Nixon will be back going live, and I will be posting another... Um, edited video that hopefully sounds nice for you guys. Yeah, I'll just be continuing with chapter 10 of Lady Audley's Secret. We'll see how George Talboys is getting on. And yeah, we'll just have a great time. So have a good week. See you next time. Victorian Periodical Parade.